My name is Mike Kim, CTO at Outlier, and I'm here to tell you about some of our adventures and misadventures in automated insight discovery. And I'll start by, well, I suppose I have a clicker. Right? Here we are. Right. Stop. Okay. So I'll start by motivating this talk by telling you a couple of stories. The first one will take us back nine years and two months and one day. So it's February 2009, and I was working as a quantitative engineer at a small social search startup called Aardvark. And quantitative engineer is one of those titles that got subsumed by data scientists. I think there are about a dozen other titles that used to exist, and now that all of them have gone extinct in favor of data scientists. And so at this early stage startup, we had a lot of metrics. We were tracking engagement, we were tracking you know, uh, engagement by cohort, by date. So we had all these dashboards. They were very pretty. Uh, and unfortunately, we had just enough dashboards for it to be dangerous in the hands of non-technical users. And so one Monday, my CEO comes rushing to my desk because his line that had been going up and to the right suddenly was tanking and suddenly was falling. And, and very, very concerned. I said, Mike, what's going on? Users are down 10%. Users are down percent. This whole thing is, this is going to be terrible. Ah, the sky's falling. And I said, Max, relax. It's President's Day. And he's like, are you sure? So I open up the calendar and I show him, yes, it's President's Day. He goes, no, you smart ass. Are you sure that's why everything's down 10%? Like, yes, I'm sure that's why. So Tuesday rolls around, all of our numbers come back to normal, and I keep my job. And that's, a, that's the happy ending of that story. So let's fast forward eight years from there to 2017, so last year. And this is a story from one of our customers. Jack Rogers is a designer, footwear, and accessories brand. They've been around since 1960, so they've been doing business for 57, 58 years. They know their business. They know exactly when to run their marketing campaigns from spring, winter, or fall. They've got this thing down pat. But what Outlier was able to show for them was that there's an unseasonably early interest in springwear. And so they didn't, they didn't know where this was coming from, and they were, but they, they trusted the data. They were able to lean into it using uh, email marketing, and then they had a huge boost in sales in March, which was fantastic for them. And as for why, February of 2017 was the second hottest February on record in like 123 years of data keeping. Right? And so if you don't believe in climate change or global warming, well, the data tells you otherwise. Right? And so this is a great case where uh, being data-driven was enabling them to be uh, more flexible with their marketing and more tactical in these sort of ways to take advantage of trends that were organically emerging. So what's common to both of these stories is that we at Artvark and, at Jeff, and thanks to Outlier and Jack Rogers, we have all the data that we need, but we really were missing the insight that could be derived from that data. And what's complicating things today is that data today is in the, on the order of millions of dimensions. So even a small startup like ours, so we actually run Outlier on, on Outlier, so we have Meta Outlier running. Even we generate you know, upwards of a million different dimensions of data on ourselves. And the, the cardinality of what we can actually handle as humans is really just still 10 things. Right? We, it doesn't matter if we have all these fancy machine learning things. If you have to put this in the hands of a business user, you only have 10 things you can handle. And so this is the, this is the great challenge. This is the thing that we are out to solve. And fortunately, we have actually managed to build a product that does most of this. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how we try to do this and some of the lessons that we learned along the way. And so this is a very smart, very technical audience, and someone is going to ask, why not just use anomaly detection, right? If this is, it was a very well worked out field, we can just throw that at it, and be set. So the goal, remember, is going from 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 1. And anomaly detection, no matter how well you tune it, is still going to generate on the order of about 1% of anomalies any given day. So that's a two orders of magnitude reduction. That's fantastic. You know, you go from 10 to the 6, the 10 to the 4. The problem is, remember the end use case. The end use case is I have to be able to deliver this to a marketing manager, to a head of product, to some, a VP of sales, or you know, a person on their data team to be able to triage something that their human teams can go do. So 10 to the 4 is not going to cut it. 10,000 things to stare at is still, well, three orders of magnitude too many, right? So that's just not going to cut it. And furthermore, what if something isn't anomalous, but should be? Right? And so I'll give you a couple of examples. We have one of our customers who, on one of their fancy dashboard, fancy dashboard metrics, you know, the line is going perfectly within normal range, up and to the right, and hiding underneath that was a series of patterns emerging that they should have been concerned about. Because what was underlying this constant 4% growth was the fact that the majority of the users were actually growing in faster than that, and a small cohort of the users was falling off a cliff. And since they weren't tracking exactly which cohorts were which, they thought everything was honky-dory. And what they really needed to know was what wasn't anomalous underneath the overriding trend that was anomalous. So that brings us back to the goal, right? We're trying to get from 10 to 6, 10 to the 1. And so how exactly are we going to do that? And of course, we're here at Data EngConf, so we all know the answer is machine learning, right? And so where there's smoke, there's fire. And so we also have some data engineering involved. So with that, I'm going to get into some of our specific stories of what we've encountered along the way. 
And so I feel like we have to have a system architecture diagram at some point. So here's where I put mine. Uh, the colors are kind of hard to make out, but the, the palish green pukey color on the left is all of our user-facing user things. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about those today. And then the reddish oranges color are some of our tertiary helper components. Won't be talking about those either, and I'll be focusing most of my talk on our back-end processing pipeline and some of the lessons that we've learned therein. I will start by patting ourselves on the back. Here are a few things that I think we did right. I call them the three M's. Uh, we designed very modularly from the beginning. You'll notice from that architecture diagram, we aren't a single monolith, nor are we this maze of microservices that are going everywhere. Right? So we're kind of in that nice balance point between the two. And this, this theme of modularity is going to come and save us several times over, so just keep that one in the back of your head. Microservices. We have them, we didn't go crazy with them, right? And so this is the key thing. The key, the key, the key uh, telltale sign for us for when we don't have to deploy a microservice is when we needed to share something between different parts of the stack, whether it was the processing part of the stack or the front-end part of the stack, if there was a functionality that was in common, that's when we decided to build a microservice. We didn't architect the whole thing as a maze of microservices. Oh, hey, audience members over there. All right. And then, of course, the thing that ties all this together is messaging, right? And so we, we actually use Kafka to do a lot of our messaging, which, quite frankly, is overkill at the stage that we're at right now. And this is one of the few places where I think we over-designed or we put something that was heftier than we needed to, to put in place. Uh, the reason we, and uh, by the way, if anyone who's worked here professionally knows that I always err on the side of too simple and not, not robust enough, because uh, I, I like to have something that I can just work towards and replace if I need to see earlier comment modularity. But in the case of Kafka, it's easy to deploy, it's standard, and we knew that we would never outgrow it, right? So this was one of those kind of things we could drop in, and even if it's too much engineering for the time, we could use it for now. All right, so I'll go after the flash through some of these. Data collection, obviously this is, that's where it lives. Uh, we have two different types of data that we collect. One is from our cloud sources. It, you know, here's a sampling of them. Obviously, they're web analytics and all these other forms. And on the other side, we spend any number of the SQL dialects we can collect from there as well. So when you're dealing with cloud sources, I mean, there's a litany of kind of questions that you can run into. Uh, and you know, everyone who's developed against a third-party API knows that there are questionable documentation, incomplete documentation, and just flat-out wrong documentation. My only piece of advice there is trust but verify, right? And then I think the thing that I would like to talk about was actually touched on in Artem's talk, which is sampling. So sampling, as he pointed out, is a great strategy for when you're trying to do web analytics in general, but there are actually cases where it doesn't work very well at all, and ours is one of them. Once you're subsampling amongst very, lots of different dimensions or long time windows, sampling actually starts performing pretty badly. And so our current strategy is actually quite terrible. We uh, try to grab as much data we can as aggressively as we can, and when we notice that that's heavily sampled and doesn't work for us, we go to the opposite extreme and grab as narrow a slice as possible, use that as our core bench, as our core gold standard, and basically figure out how, what's, the, what's the range in between that we can kind of binary search our way towards something that's acceptable. It's not a super elegant solution, but it's the one that we've adopted. And so if you're trying to build an analytic system against a third party that's sampling you, that might be a good kind of a search strategy to keep in mind. And on the SQL side, uh, there are a you know, very similar parallel set of questions. And the one thing I would point out here is that as data architects, we kind of have the same attitude that drivers have. You know, they pull drivers and ask, you know, how, how good of a driver you are? And everyone says, I'm an above average driver. And of course, that's not possible. And as data architects, if I asked you, you know, how good is your, how clean is your schema? You're all going to say, oh, it's a pretty clean schema. You know, better, cleaner than average schema, right? And of course, that's not true. Uh, some of the unique schema things that we, quirks that we come across, uh, column names with spaces in them. Uh, we didn't actually handle that and escape that correctly. That like, blew up our entire stack once. Um, Column names are really, really, really long. Like, you would think that 255 characters would be more than enough characters for anybody's column names, and apparently not. Apparently some people just need, these people are laughing at each other because they know. <laughs> apparently it's just not long enough for some people. And in our strategy of prepending like outlier specific information on top of that, just exploded this really badly. On, on, and, and I think my last favorite one is uh, duplicate column names, which also, if you're not fully qualifying your column names, makes things really painful when you try to join them. And of course, our favorite topic, time zones, uh, and the closely related daylight savings. My lead engineer, I literally spent 20 minutes at a whiteboard trying to figure out if this most recent spring forward was going to bite us or not, and in which, the offsets, which way the offsets have to go. So like, we have four degrees in computer science between the two of us, and we still couldn't figure it out. It's terrible. The one thing I would say here is, as early as possible, get global customers. We were very fortunate that among our first set of early customers was Times Internet, which is a company in India, and so we were able to automatically have to force to bite this bullet much earlier. And so even if you don't, I would say even insert a company on, on that timeline. Database selection, so this is our primary storage, and ours is really a classic tale of woe of SQL versus NoSQL. We adopted RethinkDB when it was just my co-founder and I hacking a prototype together. 
but we realized you know, that we, that we have outgrew it and lumber the analytics loads that we're putting on it, which is just something it was never designed to do, never designed to handle. Uh, fortunately, thanks to modularity, we were able to actually slowly migrate, migrate away from that. And so my key piece of advice here is, no matter what data store you pick, unless you are 100% certain that you will never migrate off this data store, put a layer between you and your actual data store so you can swap out your needs transparently. Search, this is a bit ironic because I spent several years working for Google, but we actually didn't have a search feature, in, a search indexing feature until quite recently, uh, and it lives here in our diagram. So here's some signs that we should have realized a lot earlier than we did, that we should have had like a search index like Elasticsearch, which is how we implemented ours. Uh, front end use cases, we literally had something on our product called search, and yet we didn't index anything. It's like, okay, wait, that, that should have been like, hey, guys, wake up, wake up. You should, you should be indexing something. Uh, and the way we're getting around it instead of indexing things is we were just running much more complex queries and creating more and more indices on our primary data store until you're laughing again because you've done this, right? Absolutely. Yes. So if you're doing these things, you should probably stop and then figure out how you should index things properly. And of course, eventually what breaks down is you're, you get, you're, your front end becomes unusable because no matter how smart you are of optimizing your queries, you just can't get around it at some point. And then finally, there were a lot of other use cases that we could have unlocked and that we have unlocked since then. And even back-end non-user-facing ones. And that's actually something that uh, was really like, ah, oh, why didn't we do this earlier? Uh, and then finally, monitoring. This is my last point, and I'll, I'm getting yelled at, so I'll move, I'll move quickly. This is another thing I think that we did well, but I have some lessons to share with everyone else. Very early, we put in SLAs. We are obviously a B2B company, and so we have customers, and they demand service at certain levels. Even if you're not, if you're processing data, and even if it's artificial, I would say it's really helpful for teams to have targets where they can use this so that when you start going outside of your SLAs, you can actually push back on product priorities and say, hey, we have these SLAs. I know they're internal, but this is a good, this, we always said that if we go outside of these, this is when we would prioritize working on tech debt or other optimizations to get back on this. Because like, we get asked this question a lot where it's just, hey, how do you make time to like, work on our stack and improve it? Well, you need some sort of trigger mechanism to force that conversation. So SLAs are one good way to do that, even if you don't have them on the customer side. Obviously, for that, System performance, which is closely tied to SLAs. The, far, the forward point, the only thing I would add on that is when you have third-party data, whether it's SQL databases or cloud services, one great way of catching things like API changes or like you know API changes uh, is a great is when you have all these error and exception handling. So recently, I think one of our one of our third-party vendors literally broke something on their API, and we were able to catch that and report it to them before they were able to fix it for themselves. And then since, our, since we are in the business of noise reduction, we do have to check yield, because sometimes we're overly aggressive. You know, 10 to the 1, great. 10 to the 0, not so good, right? And so we, we do have to watch out for that. And then finally, since this is a machine learning system, we do have model performance characteristics, because we do want to keep track of when, you know, we have model burn-in issues, or we have model burn-out issues. And so that's what we do. So our current system highlights, we have an ETL platform that ingests hundreds of million data points an hour from 17 different sources and counties. <coughs> we do achieve 4.4 orders of magnitude reduction. So for those of you keeping track at home, that's a million to about 40. So we're just outside of the mark that we're looking for. And then we have a bunch of these advanced clustering algorithms that we'd love to talk about some amount of time. Uh, and with that, thank you. <laughs> Questions? I would like to thank the, the peanut gallery right here for the moral support. It's like, yes. I have one that's kind of open-ended. This, this is kind of open-ended, but you uh, talked about general lessons that you've learned, and then you said that you ingest hundreds of millions of data points per hour. I'm thinking of myself as like, how would I begin to get to 100, hundreds of millions of data points per hour? Do you have any advice on that? Start small. Start so when we started, so when we write the glorious retrospective of Outlier and this billion dollar company and how we got there, we'll tell you that this was done on purpose, right? I mean, this was our strategy all along. Uh, but the reality was when we got started, the only people who trust us with their data were small startups, right? And so we were like, hey, small startup, we're a small startup, great. And we were able to like get their data and work with it and so develop our models. I like that we had a previous talk about going the proxy model, like that's where we got our proxy model, like friends, friends and friends and family companies. Of course, based on that, we were able to slowly work our way up the food chain to larger companies, to larger companies. And now we recently signed a Fortune 500 company, and so now we've like leapt into that next order of magnitude of data. And now, of course, there we're talking to people at Fortune 100, Fortune 50, and keep continually leaping upwards and upwards. Uh, and so that's, that's the way we got started. Yes? How would you deliver the insights to the companies? Is, is there an interactive tool, or 
Great question. So one of the unique things that we've done, and this is this sets apart from a lot of BI tools, is we're not a dashboard. We're not like an alerting tool. We provide a what, the equivalent of like a social media feed, but for your business data. So every day, you like you might check your Facebook or your Twitter feed. You check your outlier feed, and your outlier feed will contain five to ten stories about things that are happening inside your data today. 